Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Jordi, and I'm going to talk about how three engineers built a sales-led company. Before we start, I want to give you a couple of numbers. I've got 27 minutes to give this talk, 115 slides. So if you do the math, 27 minutes, 60 seconds per minute, 115 slides, that's 14 seconds per slide. So it's going to be a lot of content. There is also 86 numbers in this presentation. On the slides alone, if you include the screenshots, there are more numbers in this presentation than people in Slash. There's over 17,000 numbers. So we're going to do numbers today. First, let me talk briefly about myself, although um, my friends already introduced me. My name is Jordi Romero. I'm founder and CEO at Factorial. Factorial is an HR software company that helps thousands of organizations around the world, mainly Europe, to automate all of their processes. We started the business seven years ago with three engineers, and we built a very fast-growing business that's mainly sales-driven, with hundreds, more than 600 people in our sales team. Notice one thing that's missing in this slide, and this is something I like to make fun of European founders. I'm not a PhD, MD, ex McKinsey, GmbH, all the weird suffixes that people put on their job titles because I'm a pretty simple dude, and that's actually very important for this presentation. We're going to talk about simple concepts. So before, how do I introduce myself as a, sim as a simple person? Well, I'm a founder. Um, I'm also a CEO. I'm a dad. I'm a programmer. I'm an investor. I have a coffee business in Barcelona, actually. You're all welcome to come. I also own a co-working business. I host a podcast. I like to sail. I like to climb. I do yoga. And I do woodworking to relax myself and not be in front of a screen. So that's a simple guy for you. So now, in summary, what, I'm, what I am is a nerd. I'm a computer engineer. I've been a programmer since I'm 13 years old. And I approach business the same way I approach everything, by just trying to understand things. Like, people call these first principles. I just call it thinking hard, understanding the problems from the basic fundamentals. So before we get started about how we built a sales machine at Factorial, let me give a couple of runs. First of all, everything you see on the internet is not true. I guess you all know that, but you founders, many of you I'm sure are founders, tend to go online and read about how other companies did that, and what their playbooks are, and what their recommendations are, and I recommend you don't do that at all. The second thing you do as founders is listen to the crap that VCs like to tell us, and I highly, highly encourage you to not do that. VCs are great. They can give us some money and share some experiences, connect us to great people, but it doesn't necessarily mean they know how to do our job. So I would just warn you to not listen to everything that VCs will tell you. And uh, I also want to encourage you to be aware that you probably know more than you think. If you actually stop and use your brain and stop listening to the noise around you and do simple math, you can actually figure things out. Thinking hard, that's a concept I really like. It just means stopping what you're doing right now and understanding deeply what you're doing, why you're doing it, how does it work, break it down, to the simplest, smallest number you can come up with. That's what I do as a nerd anyway. And lastly, what we do is hard. Building companies, scaling businesses is hard. But for most of us, it's not rocket science. For some of you, it is. But for me, it definitely wasn't. So anyway, back to the talk. We are not going to talk about PLG. You know what PLG is? Some people call this thing product-led growth. Uh, for me, product-led growth is the opposite of what I'm going to talk about. It's a complex thing. I ask VC, VCs made up this concept, and I ask them what it means. And they all give me really complex answers. So I'm like, is it self-service? Is it a virality product? Is it inbound? Is it, what does it mean? And then they just tell me a bunch of other complex words. So I'm going to talk about business. And business, from my perspective, is very simple. You know what, to me, a business person is? A business person is somebody who knows how to count. It's somebody who understands their business to the simplest, most basic numbers. If you can do that, you can run a business. And that's what we're going to talk about today. More specifically, we're going to talk about go-to-market, GTM. So how we built a sales machine, being three engineers, being myself a simple dude that knew how to count. So I'm going to start with one of my favorite VC sayings. And that's actually something I found online. And then I met this VC, and they told it to my face. You cannot have a sales team if your ACVs are not higher than 50,000 euros or dollars or whatever. And I asked the guy, OK, why? And then he started telling me about this playbooks and rules of thumb and then a bunch of acronyms. And I'm like, yeah, but why? Can you, can you explain to me with numbers? Can, can we do the math together? And my conclusion is 100% bullshit. <laughs> like, I don't agree with that. And I'm actually going to use that example, that particular phrase, 
from many VCs, from many people, many experts um, online in why this is bullshit and how to train you, hopefully, to do the simple math. So in the world, we have constraints. Constraints are just part of nature, they're reality, and we need to understand them. But they are real constraints, and they're made up constraints. So I'm going to start with the real constraints. You know what's one constraint that I use all the time? Well, there's 12 months in a year, right? So we're going to use this concept a lot. There's 12 months in a year, that's real. The way we count months and years, there's 12 of them. There are 20 days in a month, interesting number. There's, sorry, 20 working days in a month. There's 24 hours a day, but unfortunately, most of us are only able to work around eight hours a day. So this is an important number. 12 months, 20 days, eight hours. People typically don't work for free, so we need to embrace that there's going to be some cost to these hours that we're going to put towards building a company. We tend to have limited money in the bank, and if not, it's good to think that we have limited money in the bank and just try to scope our investments in a way that makes sense. And then we have some other real constraints, such as gross margin. In this case, I put 85%. That's our gross margin. That's pretty typical software as a service or software business gross margin. So I'm going to tell you why this is important in a second. But anyway, those are some real constraints. When we plan or model out our go-to-market and we can see if we can scale with salespeople with an ACV, an average contract value, annual contract value below 50K, then we need to have these real constraints. Now, there are some other made-up constraints. For example, one of my favorites, salespeople make 150K a year. VCs say that. In Silicon Valley, it can be true, but it can also be not true. You know what's true? The top 1% of workers in Finland make 91,000 euros or more. The top 1% of the population make 91K or more. Which means if you want to hire in your sales team, the top 1% earners in Finland, you need to pay at least 90K. But if you're fine with the bottom 99%, then you don't need to pay 90K. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. The top 1% in Europe is 46K. It, it sounds weird because all of us are in tech, but the reality, if you look at the, at the statistics, is you don't need to make 150K to sell software. And I'm going to show you why. Another one that I like is a bunch of acronyms, uh, the quotas versus uh, AEs, OTE. I don't know if you know what that means. The quota is the objective you give a salesperson. And AE is an account executive, is how we call salespeople. And uh, OTE is on target earnings. So it's how much the salesperson is expected to make or supposed to make if they hit the quota. So there is one rule of thumb, which is that the quota should be five times their OTE, meaning if you pay them 100K, they should sell at least 500K. But first of all, maybe you don't need to pay 100K. And second of all, maybe that's bullshit. Let's figure out. Another one, ratios. So there are a bunch of ratios, SDR to account executive. SDRs is how we call sales development representatives, the people that typically find sales opportunities and hand them to an account executive. So that's how a lot of sales teams work. Somebody, uh, somebody provides leads, that's typically marketing. Somebody qualifies these leads, that's typically an SDR. And somebody closes these opportunities into customers, that's an account executive. And then if you care, there's an account manager that will take care of them. But anyway, one-to-one -one SDR to AE ratio. Is this the right ratio? Somebody has an opinion on this? No? I see people saying no. Maybe this is the right ratio? Maybe this is the right ratio? I don't know, I don't care. <laughs> But what I care about is there is eight working hours in a day, I need to pay people money, and there is limited amount of stuff you can do, and there is limited money in the bank, and we'll do the numbers bottom up. So anyway, CAC to LTV, that's when you divide the cost of getting a customer by the amount of money this customer is paying you over their lifetime. Interesting number, maybe, we'll see. CAC payback period, that's how many months, typically measured in months, it takes for you to get the money back from an investment in acquiring customers. These are all made up concepts. So again, we're going to talk about go-to-market from first principles. I hate that expression. Just doing basic math. So let's math together. This is pricing, 99 euros per month. Is this a good pricing or a bad pricing? Somebody has an opinion? I think it's like the worst pricing ever, yet it's super common. But I'm going to use the worst pricing ever in this example. So we're going to assume that our customers are going to pay 99 euros a month. Why is this bad? because probably it doesn't reflect the value we're delivering to our customers. It doesn't take into account how much value we're giving them. So maybe there is a usage pricing, per seat pricing, per module pricing that we could use. But anyway, I'm going to use the worst possible pricing I see B2B SaaS companies use, which is 99 euros per month. Now, 12 months in a year, that's a fact. 85% gross margin, maybe that's a fact. Let's assume that this is a fact. So first math, 99 euros times 12 months times 85% gross margin. That means that each customer is producing roughly rounding the numbers, 1,000 euros 
of gross margin. That's like what you actually keep as a business after you serve your customers. Okay, this pricing, 19 euros a month times gross margin, 1,000 euros. Let's use this number as our ACB for the example. Again, it's pretty bad business, but we're going to use that. Now, to get a customer, you probably need to talk to multiple potential customers. We're going to call them opportunities. So in this example, I'm assuming you need to talk to four opportunities to get one customer. So we call this a 25% conversion rate from deal to customer. Maybe that's the case. That's reasonable. That's what we do. Um, now, how many customers or potential customers can you talk to in a day? Let's say four. That's four demos. Four demonstrations, if you're selling software like we do, you do a Zoom call, you show the software, you ask a bunch of questions, and then if they like it, then you eventually sell to that customer. Can you do four a day? Yeah, I think you can do eight in a day. You know, eight 30-minute demos plus half an hour to kind of manage the next demo and so on. Let's say we only do four a day because we prepare them really well and we don't work that hard and we don't want to pressure the people, so they can do four demos in a day. 20 days in a month, again, that's a fact. More math. Four demos a day times 20 days in a month, that's 80 demos in a month. Let's assume we close 25%, as we said before, of these demos into customers. That means one account executive, one salesperson could potentially bring 20 customers in a month. Now, that's a bit generous. I'll give you that. One person, 20 customers, that needs to be a very high velocity type of business. It can be done. We've done it. It's not an average. Let's say they only do 10% conversion rate between a demo to a customer. That means 10 meetings, one customer. Instead of four meetings, one customer, it's 10 meetings, one customer. That's very low. So if that's your conversion rate, I would say change something. Like this is not very efficient. Maybe the problem wasn't the ACV to begin with. Maybe the problem is you don't know how to sell. Maybe the problem is you're talking to the wrong people. So actually, I would say it was something like a 20% conversion rate. That's conservative in my opinion. 20% means every five demos, one of them is going to end up being a customer. That means one account executive will produce 16 customers in a month. 16 customers in a month, 12 months in a year, math, 192 customers per account executive. Now, times 1,000, that's 192K. So this one account executive, hypothetical, was able to generate, in this pretty conservative, terrible pricing business, 192K of revenue. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but... So, 192K. Now, there's a smartest here that's saying, wait a second, how can you do four demos in a day? Where are these demos coming from? Like, is somebody handing you these demos? Are you doing it yourself? Then you're not working eight hours a day, then you're working more. So let's assume there is an SDR, a sales development representative, that's feeding demos to this account executive. So let's figure out, what does an account executive, sorry, what does an SDR do? They do phone calls. They do phone calls. They do 60 phone calls a day. They try to do 60 phone calls a day. Now, out of these 60 phone calls, maybe 20% actually connect. The other one, people don't pick up the phone, or they hang up, or it's the wrong person, or whatever. So let's say an SDR is doing 60 phone calls a day, which is a very reasonable number. Out of those 60, only 20% actually mean something. So that's 12 calls. And there's 20 days in a month. So 12 times 20 equals 240 successful calls in a month. 40% success rate, meaning we qualificate, we qualify, sorry, 40% uh, of these 240 successful calls that we did, that means we're able to book 96 demos. Now, you remember how many demos our account executive was able to do in a month? That was 80. Four demos in a month, 20 days. Uh, four demos in a day, 20 days in a month, 80. We get 96 from one SDR, which means one-to-one -one ratio is actually good. In this math, one SDR can pull off 96 demos, one account executive can handle 80, and together they can generate 192,000 euros in a year. But the smartest is saying here, wait a second, to do 60 calls in a day, who are you calling? Where are these phone numbers coming from? Are there inbound leads? Is this a database? Somebody needs to be feeding you that. That's going to cost some money. That's, you know, that's going to keep playing in the math. So you're right, we need leads to be able to feed the SDR. Now the problem is if I keep doing math this way all the way to the visits to the website, it's going to take me two hours, and I only have 27 minutes, 14 seconds per slide. So I'm going to change framework here. I'm going to stop doing this basic math. I assume you know how to multiply and divide. I'm going to talk about payback periods, which is a made-up constraint that I actually like. It's a way to size an investment in acquiring customers. So here in the screen, you can see 24 little circles. Each circle represents a month. In this hypothetical case, each month is 99 euros which means that for every customer, for every euro we spend to get customer, we're going to allocate them in months. One example. This is a real example. It takes us three months of payback period, which means 
300 euros, more or less, and 99 euros a month, to generate the lead that will become a customer. So do the math, conversion rate, divide it by the conversion rate, and that's the cost per lead. Uh, if you're paying ads, for example, you can see you need very cheap leads if you only spend 300 euros in marketing for this customer. So that's a challenge with this pricing. We'll talk about that. You spend 400 euros in SDRs to get this customer, and you spend, I think, that's 700 euros in account executives to close this customer. So you understand this concept? We size our investment in acquiring customers in how many months of their recurring subscription it's going to take to get the money back. Simplifying, if it's going to take me 14 circles to get a customer like this case, it means I'm going to pay 1,400 euros up front, and I'm going to get 100 euros every month until month 14, I'm break even. Month 15, I start making profit. If you want to be super strict, you can multiply this by your gross margin, and then you have your gross margin adjusted payback period, which private equity likes. But let's go back to the topic. Uh, this would be PLG, I guess. I don't know what it is. But in this example, we're spending seven months of payback period in marketing, and then the user kind of figures out the product themselves. There is no qualification. They're ready to buy. They just press a button, and then maybe an account executive just negotiates the contract. So that would be a hypothetical PLG uh, payback period. That's us. That's factorial in some markets, not all of them. In reality, we spend three months in generating a lead. Why is that? Because we do organic traffic, we do things that are scalable and they're pretty cheap incrementally. Then we have a very efficient machine of hiring, training, and uh, working with SDRs and account executives in strategic locations. So we're able, to, we're able to spend only one month in the SDR team and two months in the account executive team, again, in some markets, to get our customers. Now, this is also us factorial in different markets. So traffic is more expensive. Maybe our SEO is not so good, and we need to pay some money to Google. Maybe the SDRs are harder to hire, and maybe the kind of executives take longer to close. So you know, you adjust these numbers, but you can see 12 months payback period, by the way, in general, pretty good. 24 months, well, nowadays it's not very popular. Now that's also us. I don't only want to show the good stuff. <laughs> we started doing paid marketing. Paid marketing basically means you pay a lot of money to Google and Facebook and LinkedIn, but mostly Google and Facebook. And they start sending traffic to your website. And then you keep spending money, and they keep sending you traffic. And the thing is, it can very easily go nuts, which is what happened to us. So we started generating this type of customers, and then we realized, and we stopped. But you know, paid marketing is dangerous, learning for the future. So if you torture the numbers, everything is possible. But what's the point? OK, let me tell you the point. You actually have to torture the numbers. This document I'm sharing here, this is a document we use internally. It's real. I blurred it a little bit. We call it Samba because it's a cool name, and it stands for Sales and Marketing Budget. And the A is in between, so it's pronounceable. So Samba is the most important document in Factorial. It's a document that has close to 17,000 numbers, as I said, more than people in Slash. Let me zoom out for a second. That's Samba. For one country, by the way. We operate in nine countries. That's Samba zooming out. And then let me scroll. That's Samba scrolling. So all of these numbers, on their own, they're very simple. Like Each number is the atom of what we're doing. How many visits are coming to our website? How many of these visits are giving their contact details? How many of them are being called by an SDR? How many calls? How many qualifi qualified opportunities? How many meetings? How much do we pay the account executive? How much do we pay for the lead? All of these numbers, each in themselves, they're very simple to understand. Five-year-old can understand these concepts. So we use five-year-old numbers, and it makes sense. It works. That's how we use to track our business. So my advice to founders, especially founders that are good with numbers, and I hope this is all of them, is just do the numbers. Just don't assume because internet or VC said something, something's going to work or not work. So how did we do it? should say with the right topography. Well, first of all, we started doing organic traffic. Why? Because our pricing is not 99 euros. Our actual pricing, it's complex, but on average, we end up making like four to 500 euros per customer per month. So it's better than 99, but it's not like 50K. Uh, so we need cheap leads. And what's cheap and scales? Organic traffic, SEO, content. We are big believers in content. So we started with organic, investing very heavily seven years ago when we started the company. First couple of employees were engineers. The next one was an SEO person. The next one was a content person. So very early on, we believed we need to start building this asset. We have software and content, and these are our two assets. Second thing we did is inside sales, because we sell to HR managers. And HR managers are not necessarily ready to just press a button, put their credit card, and PLG. 
They actually need someone to ask questions. Things are complex. Is this law? Is this country? Is this whatever problem I have being solved by your product? So we created an inside sales team that talked to the traffic, to the leads that came from the online traffic, and closed them. And actually, surprisingly to me, we even did outbound, which means that we didn't use the free traffic that came to our website. We created a team that found databases of opportunities and just cold called these opportunities. And believe it or not, same payback period. So if you can do it very efficiently, if you prepare these databases, feed them into your CRM, and have a team that's very fast, very agile, and high velocity calling these databases, and you have a product that helps a lot of people potentially, so there's a lot of yeses and a lot of noes, but a lot of yeses, then you can make outbound work. We made it work. 25% of our growth comes from outbound with really small ACVs. That blows the mind of all the VCs I ever met. Then we started doing paid. paid and uh, I said pain because that's what comes to mind when I think about paid. We got into horrible pain. We spent millions of euros in not generating millions of euros worth of business, so we stopped doing paid. We do a little bit of it, but only the, the, the really profitable one. And we now moved on to channel. Channel sales means other people's, other teams' salespeople. So instead of us scaling more and more and more salespeople, I told you we've got around 600 people in our sales team. We said, where is this going to end? We want to continue growing, but we don't want to have 10,000 salespeople, 60,000 salespeople. So we said, a lot of companies out there have salespeople, and then they don't have enough stuff to sell uh, through that salespeople. So we started doing business development and strategic alliances and channel partnerships, and yeah, it works. Uh, this year, we're going to be doing around 20% of our growth coming from uh, channel sales at the, end of the, at the end of the year. So it's another way to make it scale. Again, do the numbers. Self-service, that's something we didn't do. Some people said that's what we should do. We try, we're not very good at it. I think we'll try it again. I think eventually we'll do it. But this is something that we're thinking about. Now, what metrics this, this uh, led to? First of all, we've been growing 3x for the last few years. It compounds to pretty significant growth from zero to many tens of millions in revenues. We managed to get six months payback period in some markets, not in all markets, but again, extremely efficient. We managed to get our customers to stick around for long and even upsell and grow with us with 120% net revenue retention in some markets, not all of them. And it led us to 1 billion euro valuation, an American billion of euros, uh, unfortunately. Uh, last year when we did our Series C, Le Atomico of 120 million, we're 1,000 people in the team, still growing extremely fast all across Europe, Latin America, and North America. And to close, I want to touch on two more things. One is this type of business, the one that we created, which by the way is not for everybody, it requires a certain company culture. And I think that's very important as founders because you need to math and you need to really understand what your culture is. Not what you want it to be, what it actually is. And then be consequent. This is a culture that requires high velocity. All of these numbers you saw here, you cannot be slacking. You need to be delivering, moving forward all the time. And when something goes off track, you need to cut it fast. You need to make a lot of decisions and you need to make them fast, which I call high velocity. You need to set pretty high goals. Not high velocity, there we go. You need to set pretty high goals because you know, you're pushing everybody to do what most people believe is not reasonable. So you do the math, it makes sense, but people say, wait, but you know, an account executive is supposed, no, but an SDR is supposed to, no, I don't care, I, I did the math. This can work. You will see. This is very hard to get started. When you get one person actually doing the numbers that your spreadsheet show, that's magic. When you get two people, you're done. You just need to keep hiding people, putting them next to these two people, and they balance themselves out. Obviously, the ones that don't work out, they need to rotate out and replace them with somebody who will hit it. This requires a highly educated team, but I want to highlight one point. This highly educated team needs to be highly uneducated before they come to us. Because if they're highly educated before they come to us, they think they know everything and they know it wrong. They know the playbooks and the rules of thumb and the things that are written on the internet and the VCs say. So we need smart people that know how to count. It's very easy. And then we do the numbers for them. And we say, look, you know, 12, 12 months in a year, 20 days in a month, blah, 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 and then they get it. So we need to invest in helping people count. That means that our profiles are quite unique. We need people who are open-minded who are willing to break all the rules and do things that sound odd at the beginning and you know, eventually make sense. Uh, it also means that location is important. Maybe San Francisco is not the best place to have 600 salespeople for a SME software business. Probably not. But there are other places in the US, there are other places in Europe, there are other places everywhere where, again, 
most of the population would be very happy with a fraction of the salary of a San Francisco Bay Area salesperson. So don't constrain yourself. Make trade-offs. That also means we cannot hire very senior people for some of those roles that scale because the numbers don't add up. Now, at the beginning, that was a challenge. As we grow and you know, the scale of the whole company grows, then we can afford to hire a few very senior people because we only need a few of them and we can amortize them among many, many customers. But the roles that scale, meaning we have a lot of them, then we cannot hire very senior people. We need to hire people that are early in their career, show them what's possible, pay them very aggressive variable compensation, and the good ones will make a lot of money and show the others that it can be done. And it means that outside playbooks are forbidden. When we interview for executives at Factorial, which is a very hard thing for us to do because we need to kind of make them forget everything they think they know, the first thing that we look for are playbooks. And if we interview people that know all the playbooks, they're out. Because they don't work in our business, they need to create their own playbooks. So, last, learnings from, as an engineer, figuring out a bottoms-up go-to-market. First of all, 100% bullshit was true. You can have salespeople in an SME software business. We have it, it's profitable, it scales tremendously well. Number two, there are millions of people out there that are very talented that you can hire for 20, 30, 40, 50K. I'm talking European salaries, but it's true. That's the majority of the people, and I'm not even talking other continents, I'm just saying in Europe. So, do we think these people are not smart enough? Maybe they just don't know what SaaS is. We can teach them. It's very easy to understand what SaaS is. It's easy to sell if you're a smart person. There is tons of talented smart people out there that you can hire and teach them what they need to know. Now, that said, hiring is hard. So you need to build your own proprietary hiring methods and interviewing and hiring managers at the end of the day. It's a people business. So you need to have people that are very good at smelling the right talent, at detecting the raw talent because it cannot be proven. Because if it's proven, it's too expensive. But if it's raw, then it can work, and then they can grow with the company. It's very important to teach people how to count. Hopefully, some of you will go back and say, oh shit, I never counted. And you're gonna start counting in your business, so I'll be very proud if that happens. And you need to build your own model. Again, Samba, very easy. Start with the bottom and just build it up. 17,000 numbers in one, how is it called, um, tab of the Google Sheet. So, in closing, three action items for you. One, give Factorial a try. If your company is not using Factorial, of course I'm going to sell Factorial. Number two, come talk to me. I'm actually very shy. And number three, if you're also shy, just follow me on Twitter and we'll talk there. Thank you very much. I hope you liked it. See you around.